right, guys, we're here with Michael Allen Nelson, uh, currently doing 30 different books at Bloom Studios, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's start, let's go back a few years and start. Um, one of the ways that we first discovered you when we, as reviewers, uh, doing stuff is through uh, Hext, which he actually kept bugging me uh, to read over and over and over and over again, until I finally gave in and did it. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> what was the genesis of that? story. That actually started, I, I had written a series called Fall of Cthulhu, um, which is sort of a uh, you know, Lovecraftian story told in modern times. And during the process of writing that series, I created a uh, character, Lucifer. And what had happened is we all realized we really, really like this character. She's got a great backstory. She's just fun to read about and fun to write. So why don't we take her out of that Lovecraftian universe and put her in my own universe? So that's that's how Hex came about. So we need to go read Fall of Cthulhu then. Yes, 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 <laughs> please do. <laughs> um, how did you get then to move on? Let's see. Was the next thing you did after that 28 Days Later? I want to say yes. I, I mean, I've, I've written so many things right, for a little yeah. bit. It's kinda, I hard to remember the chronology, but I think it was pretty shortly after that. Did you pitch something to them or did they come to you? The, the story I like to tell is that when they acquired the license, I, I find out about it, I like to tell people that I went into the office with you know, uh, a gallon of kerosene and a book of matches saying, you need to let me write this or else. Um, but what happened is I did go in and say, hey, I love this property. I would really like to write this series. And they looked at me and said, well, that's nice, but it's 28 days later. We, you know, everybody's kind of expecting a high-profile writer. We need, some, we need a heavyweight behind this. And so what I did then is I went home and I wrote a six-page story um, uh, for them to read and say, look, this is what I can do with your character. This is what I can do in your universe. This is how I can tell a story. I wrote it. They read it. They loved it and said, okay, you've got the job. So did you figure out the entire... Them going back into London and picking up the the, uh, the kid and there was there was yeah there was already uh, like an, a basic outline in place about where they, they knew they wanted wanted it to start in a um, the Scandinavian refugee camp and then end back in London uh, during the events of this movie sequel twenty eight weeks later mm. so it was up for me to how to you know how to you know come with you know the reason why the connective tissue all that all that kind of stuff so there was just that basic sort of like we know we want to begin here we know we want to end here now. Go make it happen. Right. And one of the things that's tricky about horror comics is that a lot of times, uh, especially if it's something with zombies, they want to just show blood and gore, mm -hmm. and it loses something, you know, obviously when it's drawn on the page. Where I felt you did a really good job with atmosphere and the creepy stuff and the, uh, what was the, uh, the, the marionette, was that what it was? The cage with the oh, arms? Mannequin. Mannequin. <laughs> mannequin. That's what it was. Mannequin. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was, I, I was actually really proud of that. And like, what is something that we, you know, haven't really seen it can be really uh, truly scary, and and the idea of being forced to stand in that cage and not move while all this horrificness is trying to get at you like how terrifying for hours, yeah, for hours. And, and, and you know once, that was that was one of the most incredible scenes I think I've it, ever you know, seen. It, it, it's you know it, you know as a writer you know as we as as when you write things you always go back and read stuff and you're like oh gosh why did I write it that way oh uh, you know I mean, we all have self doubt and things like that but that's just that one idea I'm like well that was actually pretty cool I'm glad I, I came up with that so <laughs> but you know but it's all also nice as a storyteller to sort of like telegraph those things uh, because when um, they first get into I think it's Edinburgh. Um, that they, that they find the mannequin and they come across this cage with this red circle spray painted in the center and they're like, what's this? And they don't know. Right. And, so, and they actually, I think Selena actually now is like, do we really need to find out? Let's just sort of, <laughs> right. so it's nice to be able to come back and something that looks innocuous to turn out to be this, this horrific device of torture or death. So now that you, you did a story that kind of bridged the two movies, mm -hmm. uh, of course there's rumors of a third movie mm -hmm. out there. Have they said anything about this remaining as canon going forward? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the talk of the movie has been going on since 
since forever, right. since even before I started writing the series. Um, and because I'm not really that involved with the, the, the Hollywood aspect, the movie aspect of it, I really don't know. I mean, I hear a lot of rumors, but that's what they are rumors. You know, from my understanding, there's a script that exists, but I couldn't say for sure. I mean, if you, know, you would think that you know, writing the comic series might give me some sort of like inside, in, right, so right. into sort of like, hey, can you get that script for me? I'd just love to read it. But if it exists, there's no way they're going to give it to me. Okay. So, but uh, so I so I have no idea if it's if it's ever going to happen or not. Okay. Um, let's see. Was there anything else at Boom before you started working at DC? Mm. I mean, as far as titles that are written? Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh gosh. I, let's see. I think the, I, I first started with Boom writing Zombie Tales. Uh, it was when, oh. yeah, I, I, I've been okay. writing for Boom since the very, very beginning. And I did, you know, Zombie Tales, Cthulhu Tales, Pirate Tales, Ninja Tales. I did uh, a series called Second Wave, Exile, Enigma Cipher. Uh, I did mal you know, uh, Malignant Man. Oh, yeah, Malignant Man. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, there's, there's a whole litany of books that I've written. Well, and like I, I was talking with uh, Apocalypse, our co-host here, uh, he kept wanting me to read Hex. I kept wanting him to read 20 Days Later. It took a long time before he realized, that's the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And you said before we got here that you get that sometimes. Yeah. People make that connection later. Right, yeah. right. It, it, it's something that, that, that now that I guess my, my profile is, is, is getting bigger, or higher, whatever the proper adjective for that is. Um, I, I'm becoming more, more well known. Uh, I, I see more people making that connection. Like, oh, you, you wrote this and you wrote this. Oh, well, what else have you written? And they realize, oh, I've read two or three new titles that I really, really, really like. And so what happens then, they're realizing that they're not just a fan of Dayman. They're not just a fan of, you know, Fall of Cthulhu. They're a fan of me, which is I, which is amazing, but a little frightening sometimes. Well, yeah, because I read Malignant Man, but I never mm -hmm. connected that that was, again, the same guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. One of the things that, and I think Dirt uh, made a point of it, was uh, a lot like, for example, The Walking Dead. Um, your stories are so good. Your, the way you interpret Selena is so well done. You are so absorbed into the characters that you almost kind of forget the zombies. You know, um, it's more about the people. Right. Well, that, um, I mean, that's that's the, that's the whole point. I remember one of the things when we first started doing Twenty Eight Days Later was that they said, "Look, if there are no infected in the story, that's okay. You know, because that's not what the story is about." And they're right, and and so e even though we wanted to have you know infected because they're just really cool to have, right, yeah. but again, it's sort of like no one no one cares um, uh, ab about zombies or infected or, or any of that stuff if you don't care about the people that are having to suffer through that and trying to survive and trying to you know is life worth living? Well, and that was I think one of the things was right out of the gate in that book. You start out with this huge cast of characters. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this is way too many people. How am I ever going to keep track of all of them? And then suddenly it was like, tragedy, <laughs> tragedy, <laughs> tragedy. Now we've got three people. That's all you have to worry about. Yeah, I, I, I like to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's fun. And, 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 of course, to try to do it in a way to where you at least become uh, you know, emotionally connected to some of these characters. So that way their, their death just is like, oh, so-and-so died today. Right. You know, um, I mean, that's the tricky part. Um, but again, yeah, you can have a cast, a large cast like that can get a, a bit unwieldy. Mm. Uh, so you have to sort of start off on which is a lot of fun. So, so let's talk about Selena. Okay. Um, it, a lot, I mean, the readers, when they're reading it, they obviously want to know more about Selena. And you had to hold off as it was going throughout the story. Right. And at the end, we learn a lot more about her past. Right, right. Can See, you talk about, like, how did you come up with deciding how you were going to end that and I mean was that difficult for you or did you have that from the very get go you're like this is how and I'm going to take it were commanded to do some of this no 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 well uh, from the get go I no, see that's something that's interesting I think I, I want to say that that was actually part of the part of the outline I would love to take credit for it uh, the idea that she had been married and you know oh, by the way spoilers for those of you at home that haven't read it um, that she had been married and was going back you know because she wanted to, to bury her her husband um, so but for me before I started writing it, I went back to watch the movie again. And one thing that I noticed when watching the movie, I noticed that she was wearing these earrings and had this pendant on the entire film. Now, she's not a vain woman. She carries around a machete and tosses Molotov cocktails. She's a bona fide badass. She's wearing these earrings, and, it's, and, so, and so I'm thinking, like, is that a way to sort of, like, hold on to her femininity? Or, you know, what's the deal? And I'm like, well, what if there's a reason, a very specific reason 
that she's wearing wearing that jewelry throughout the entire film. Because you know, if you're fighting off infected, you want you know she's covered head to toe in leather, her hair's bound up, you know she's very protected. But yet these dangling earrings become a liability. Right, they'd be ripped out. Right, right, right. So there has to be a reason she's wearing them. And so I thought, oh, if she was married before, and that's her ultimate goal to go to get back to London. Well, then that has to be the connection. So that's why when the series opens up and we have the flashbacks, we see the flashback of him presenting her with that jewelry when she opens up the box. And, and that's, that, that's the catalyst. That's when she goes, yeah, this is an opportunity, opportunity for me to go back and sort of like have that closure that I need mm -hmm. with the horrible events that happened. So, so you know, and, and then it was just, you know, having her going on that, uh, on that adventure, getting back to London. That's why when she uh, meets the, 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 the king of Edinburgh, you know, and, and, and the queen takes her earrings and she's like, well, we can't leave until I get those back. Right. And, and so, because it's that important, because that's the reason, you know, part of the reason she's Kind of what back. she's holding on to, to stay exactly. alive, kind yeah. of. Exactly. It, it, it's, it's the physical symbol of why she's going back. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of um, there being that sort of like that strong emotional need to do what she's doing and I mean, you know for me as a writer that's that's the stuff i love to, to really dig my teeth into so that was a lot of fun how did you approach it differently i mean obviously that was a, a long series that mm -hmm. was was that 40 issues uh, actually, it actually was only 24. oh boy it, it felt, felt like 40. Longer, right? <laughs> that was epic uh, well none of them were like builds they all seemed to have a lot of weight to them just about every issue it wasn't right. like it felt like okay this was just filler. Right. you weren't writing for the trade Right, yes, where right. you didn't have you know three issues that kind of builds up, three issues that kind of goes down, three issues that goes up. Right. Yeah. Well, I think you know, and also you know, you're paying four dollars a comic. I want to make sure that you get as much story as possible. You know, I, I mean, that's you know my job. I'm trying to entertain you and, and, and make it worthwhile. And so you know, even though I, I told this the series in four basically four issue arcs, each arc building on the other, just like each issue has to be you know I want it to be as dense and get for you to get as much out of it as possible. So that's why, you know, 24 issues feels like 40 issues. To me, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, because 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 it is kind of, you know, I, even though there are some comics that I enjoy that, that do that sort of like decompress storytelling, you know, it's sort of like, ah, I kind of wish I got more. It's sort of like, you could have done that in five pages as opposed mm -hmm. to 22 or right. 20. Well, we so. knew it was going to end, but we didn't want it to end. <laughs> Well, and, and, and I read the individual issues as they came out, and then recently on uh, Comicsology they re they released the omnibus as one digital. So I bought the digital version of that, oh. so I could just sit and read it on one sitting as right. one you know giant story. Mm -hmm. And and it just it amazed me how well it just fit as one story. Like we said, you weren't writing for the trade; you weren't writing the six issue arc. It was one right. solid story right. all the right. way through. Mm -hmm. So. How did you approach that differently as opposed to writing something where you know you've only got four issues? Like Malignant Man was four issues, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how, does, how do you weigh the differences in the stories? Well, the idea is it's sort of you sort of like do that mental map. It, it, because with, with uh, 20 Days Later, there's actually that physical journey. She starts in the Orkney Islands, or, you know, and then she has to move her way all the way down to London. And so you're sort of like, okay, well, she's going to be here by this issue. She needs to be here by this issue. And it's interesting because... It's such a rich universe, and they were such fun characters to write. I could have spent, you know, forty issues just, you know, up in Scotland. Mm. But you know, we needed to get them to. We needed to tell that full story in twenty-four issues, and so uh, you know, so they had to like map out by issue X. They needed to be in this in spot, yeah, in this yeah. spot. So, and, and and that sort of like informs your storytelling. And then once you break it down, like, okay, I need four issues in this location. So, so if they're. And if I know they're going to this this place next, I know that I have to get this far in that forest. Did that help you with your deadlines? Uh, it did. It did. It did. Uh, what was interesting, though, was starting off, um, I would come up with concepts and ideas uh, uh, to pitch for like what something that and her company had to go through, and not all the ideas were approved. Mm. And you know, I understand it. And you know, one thing that uh, they didn't want me to do because, and, and the comment was, that sounds like a bad '70s B movie, is the idea that they run into cannibals. Now, it does sound like a bad B '70s movie. I, I absolutely get that, but which in, I would have enjoyed. Right, right. <laughs> but see, in my mind, one of my favorite books is something called. It's a book called Lucifer's Hammer. It, 
Purnell and somebody else, I think, wrote it. Anyway, it's about an asteroid that hits the Earth. One of the most fascinating things about that book is how they discuss during the aftermath, there's a group of people that they have to resort to cannibalism because there's just, there's no food. And so it's not this weird, we're cannibals, that, you know, and, but what happens, and what I thought was interesting was the idea that the person in charge uh, forces everyone that wants to be in the group to become a cannibal. And the idea, because it's the sense of shame, it's like we've been reduced to this, which means everybody has to be reduced to this. So it's this sort of like there's a psychological component to it. And that's what I wanted to explore, not really the horrificness of it, but even so they're like, yeah, no, no. We need which is else. funny because there's a, another property that's doing a very similar story. Did it in the comics and doing it on their TV show with zombies and cannibals. Right, so, right, yeah. So, you know, so maybe it could have worked. It, 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 you know, it could have worked. But, but then again, it's sort of like, yeah, that's my job as a writer, that whatever the, the Although, concept or idea. Would you be free to do a four or six issue miniseries down the road about cannibals in the zombie apocalypse? I suppose I could. I mean, I'm not necessarily within the 20th century. Right, right, right. But yeah, yeah but, oh yeah, of course, you know. It, it, and again, to me, it's not, it, you know, it's not about the, the, the gore of, you right. know, seeing cannibals and, and zombies. It's about the people, you know, the human condition, and how how they deal with it. Make something interesting out of the event that's right, happening. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and the, thing, and, and the thing about that idea that I really liked was the idea that even like you're the bad guy, you're the you know the king cannibal, or whatever. Like the idea of it's that guilt and shame that's forcing him to do this. It's like if I have to be this kind of monster, everybody has to be that kind of, kind of monster because that's the only way I can live with myself. And that's what I like. It's that character, the you know the character reason behind that horrificness. That's the stuff that I do. So. Okay. All right, well, let's not waste all of our time here talking about 20 days later. Um, let's get to some other stuff. Okay. Um, you did go to D.C. for a while. Yes. Um, or maybe in tandem, I guess. I don't... But yeah, I was, I, was, I was doing some stuff. I, was, I think it was like uh, writing Protocol Orphans. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess it, maybe you, you can't discuss it too much, but is there a real difference in the way editorial is a boom as opposed to D.C.? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm sure every company is different. Um, you know, it, you know, I, you know, DC editorial gets a lot of flack. You know, we all know they do. But one, you know, everyone that I work with was absolutely lovely, and I also think a lot of people don't quite understand like the Herculean task of what they have to deal with. The way I look at it is, the DCU is sort of like just a giant novel. It's just all one big story, and what happens is each title is. Sort of like a chapter. Have you like uh, uh, George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire? Mm -hmm. When you read those books, it's like each chapter has a character title, like, you know, Tyrion or Cersei, and so you're reading that char character's perspective for that chapter, and that's kind of what it feels like for each chapter. So when I was writing Supergirl, I'm like, okay, this is my, this is the Supergirl chapter of this larger story, and uh, you know, so you have these guys that are trying to, 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 to juggle all of this, this this massive story with all this crossover and cross pollination going on, and I think, for me, the uh, my instinct was, you know, I, there was a specific tone that I wanted to use with with Supergirl and a certain direction I wanted to go, and you know, my instinct kept saying, okay, make it fun, make it adventurous, and really like isolate her. Let's say, really establish like this is her life on Earth, this is her learning about what it's like to, to live among humans, that sort of thing. And, 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 and things, they, they liked my ideas, but they're like, what we really need here to go out into space. Because it's got to tie into something it's, else. It's, right, exactly. And the thing is, you know, the, all, you know everything is, is um, figured out like months, sometimes even years in advance. And so you can't really, you know, they're like, we need her to interact with other people. You can't isolate her. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. So I try to do that, but then you can still kind of feel me, like pulling in this like this direction, and they like we need it to go in this direction. And so, <laughs> you know, eventually, I think they're like, you know, we we, we need to find somebody that can, that's familiar with telling a story within this larger mm. scope. So, you know, that's why I think they brought in Tony, who's been doing a great job. Right. So, yeah, um, but it was still a good read. Oh, um, okay, you. so now at Boom, mm -hmm. Damon mm -hmm. is the one you're pushing now. Yes, and. I guess uh, the the first obvious question that comes to my mind is, um, you know, vampires are pretty much a, a blank slate. No one's ever written about them before. I know. Right? <laughs> as far as people know what a vampire is. Right? <laughs> so how do you come up with something new for vampires? Um, well, it, it's the the concept behind Damon is actually Matt Gagnon's. Uh, he's the ESC over at Bowman. He had this brilliant idea, and I remember him calling calling me up and saying, "Hey, so I've got this idea that I'd like you to help me." 
to help me with. And just let me pitch it out to you and see if it's something that you'd be interested in. And of course, I'm on the phone just like nodding, like, yes, yes, let, let me be a part of it. And I think um, a majority of the vampire stories that, that, that are out there, a lot of it is very, very gothic, you know, very you right. know, dark romanticism, which is great. Um, but we wanted to do something a bit different. Uh, Damon is more of a noir mafia esque kind of has that kind yeah, of. I was going to say it's like a gangster yeah, type of thing yeah. with the families going to war with each other. Exactly, and exactly. Stuff. And also, it's sort of you know the idea. It's it's a vampire story about a human, and that's one thing that we really wanted to to see. We wanted to see how does a human operate within that world. And of course, yeah, yes, they have special training, but at the end of the day, they're still a still a human being. They have those physical and mental limitations, whereas you know the vampires don't. So how do you survive in that world? And that's the fun. That, and, you know, and, the, and the idea of you know, playing with, what would it be like to be a vampire? What would it like to be, to be immortal? And it's, it's just so much fun. Really how, do you, how do you make a person who is um, theoretically a meal to the vampires mm -hmm. be sympathetic to them? The, uh, it's not, I don't know if it's sympathy. That's a great question. That's a great question. It's, you know, the idea that the, the day men are, 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 are trained. Uh, you know, so there's a need for them. They're, they, they, you're right. There's they, they do the stuff during the day. Right, exactly. That's when the vampires can't come out. Right, exactly. Like, you know, they... they like, do the stuff. grocery shopping, you know. <laughs> that's that's exactly Christmas it. shopping. Yeah, like, it could okay. be something as mundane as grocery shopping or cleaning up or, or, or eating actually. Doing a hit. Or yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, a whole number Setting up the next livestock to be... Right. You know, we, you know one of my favorite pages <clears> in, in, in issue one is, is just a single page with like five or six panels where it shows like what David Reed goes through on a typical day. Driving cops, cleaning up, you know, feeding accidents, you know, getting, you know, receiving payments from other, you know, it's like it's he does their job during the day when they can. So. I think that's a, that's a really nice angle of the whole vampire story because mm -hmm. you always wonder, like, well, how do they do this? How do they do that? How do they get through all this? Like not every supermarket is you know? 24 hours a day. What do you right. do? Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And how so, do they hide the bodies, you know? Or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. So do they also kind of, are they the bridge to help them get victims too? No, they okay. can do that on their own. They've okay. been doing that long enough. They don't need them for that. Right, right. And so, are, are they treated lesser? Obviously, they're lesser the beings is, to them, of, right? It, uh, it depends on the family, and that's that's the fun. That you know, you know, Matt. When Matt and I talk, because because I co-write with Matt, and we'll talk about ideas and about all these different families and how each family is different and how each day man is different. And so, um, the way I like to look at it is. Uh, the vampires see their daemon as sort of like loyal pets, you know, a faithful dog. That's why they're called sun dogs. It's a bit of an insult, but, you know, that's how they're looked at, sort of like that loyal pet. You know, it's like, hey, I need you to go fetch that bone for me. Are they enchanted by the vampires? No. Yeah. Um, Damon's been uh, getting a lot of buzz mm -hmm. outside of the comics world as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any information about what might be going on out there? Yes, I do. No. Um, that, uh, again, that's an aspect that's sort of like up above my pay grade. Um, you know, it's the way, the way I, and, and I'm totally talking out of school here, the way I understand it is that it's an option. Right. And from my understanding of the way that works, that means um, that I think it's an option by Universal, which basically says Universal likes the idea. They'd like to do something with this property. Um, we just want to make sure that nobody else touches it until we've decided what we want to do with it. Um, again, I'm not a Hollywood guy. I'm not involved in any of that stuff, and so I'm, I'm just guessing. So you're not, you're not rolling in the gold teeth yet? Or no, no, not yet, but I see what we're um, no, it, you know it's it's, but it's always nice to be told you're pretty. You know? <laughs> Speaking of pretty, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're doing you're doing the, all of uh, the writing for it. Well, oh, I'm co-writing. Co-writing. Yeah, yeah. I the mean, art. I'll gladly take off the credit. Well, let, let, <laughs> let's let's talk about the art. You know, how does how does that work? You know, how what's the collaboration <laughs> like there? Oh my gosh! Seriously, can you hold it up? Show us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, show them off. We brought this them is, here. This is this is uh, Brian Stelfreeze is the artist. And I think all three of these, yeah, all three of these covers were done by, done by Brian. So that's it, just three issues so far. Really. Three issues so yeah, far. There have been some delays. There have been some delays. It's one of those things where it, it, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's not coming out as a monthly. Um, we're, you know, we're really letting Brian just really 
pardon the pun, sink his teeth into this. Um, <laughs> so you give him a little creative. Yeah, but but but, but let me explain freedom. to you. Yeah, give him that freedom. Uh, well, uh, and I'll explain more about, about that uh, in, in a little bit. But first, what happens is, you know, Matt and I will talk about well, what do we want to have happen to this issue. Then Matt will go ahead and he'll write a very detailed outline. I'll take that outline. I'll script it. I'll send it off to Matt. He'll make any sort of like notes or changes. And then I'll send it back to me. I'll do the same thing. We'll just bounce back and forth until we're happy with 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 the issue. Then that goes to Brian. And then that's when the real magic happens. And the thing is, what Brian does is he's able to add these little details and these little storytelling elements that just bring everything to life. It's not just beautiful to look at, but the storytelling is incredible. I'll give you an example. Like Issue 2 is a, a perfect example of this stuff. First of all, if you look at this cover, you'll notice that the vampires that are bursting in flame because of the sunlight, they're not bursting in flame where David's shadow is covered. Right. You know, it's little things like that. And there's also a panel in here, which I didn't even uh, notice the first time uh, I saw it. But this right here, if you look at this bottom panel here, uh, David is talking with... Uh, um, um, a vampire uh, lieutenant, her name is Kellen. If you look closely, you'll see that you see his reflection in the window, but not hers. Oh, okay. Just little things like that. Just little things like that. And of course, um, uh, you know, the, the metaphor of um, David's cane being his source of power, the idea that, you know, what seems like an instrument of weakness is an instrument of strength, and yet also the idea of it being sort of like, in this particular scene, a phallic symbol that Kellen is holding on to the entire time, thus indicating she's in absolute control of him. And, you know, there's just, it's just lots of stuff like that that goes into it. it just makes it. Do you talk about that while he's doing the artwork, or does he just come back to you later and say, I was saying it was a surprise. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times it's a surprise. I mean, we've had numerous conversations about the relationships between the characters and, 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 and their uh, relationships with one another. And so Brian is able to take all this information and uh, really bring that out visually in, in, in ways that, that we don't write into the script. Uh, because, I mean, aside from just being an incredibly talented artist, he's an incredible storyteller, a brilliant human being. He's just, he's just got it on point. I cannot express to you how amazing <laughs> this is. Um, but yeah, he, he just does such a wonderful job. And that's, honestly, that's the best part of my job is, you know, getting artwork in. And especially with somebody like Brian, when his, when his pages come in, it's just like, it's Christmas. It really is. It's Christmas morning. It's like, oh, thing, email, check this out. And you just sit there, you know, for an hour turning the images on your screen because they're just so pretty. How long is Damon going to go? I mean, is it, is it an idea of an ongoing? Or is yeah, yeah, have... yeah. I mean, we definitely have you know, the idea of an ongoing. We, we know that we have a specific story arc that we're, that we're telling. Um, but it's also one of those things where the, the universe is so rich. The idea we have 50 families, so there's at least 50 daymen. Um, you, know, you can tell the story of daymen all over the planet, all throughout time. So it doesn't have to just be present day daymen. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's just such a rich universe. And, have, and the daemon have dynamics against each other oh, yeah. as well as the families. Oh, yeah, against yeah the because family. they have loyalties to their own families. Right. And, and you know, in this particular uh, arc, you have David's family, the Virgos, uh, who's kind of going up against... They go to war with... Uh, yeah, the, the Ramses. Yeah. And, and their daemon is Jacob the Burger. So there is a power struggle. Oh, there's absolutely a power struggle. And it's also a power struggle between two newer families. And how does that relate to the old world families who look down on them? And there's just all these diff different hierarchies. It's it's just it's so much fun to play with. It really is. Is there like a central council of vampires? Like a <laughs> there? You know, you know there, like well, a, there there is it, not necessarily a central council, but the idea that the old families um, they're in charge, and when some of the younger families starts to get out get out of line, they're going to let you know. And they're not families to mess with. They've been around for millennia. So the older ones are more powerful than yes. the Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, we talked earlier about writing for the trade. When mm -hmm. you're writing on Damon, do you have a specific point, like six issues, four issues, that you think you, something's got to wrap up at that point? Yeah, well, 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 we know that we want, that basically the way we, the way we do it is uh, we know we want to tell a specific story within four issues. However... That doesn't mean, I mean, that four issues is sort of like the first building block. And then the next four issues is the next building block. But each four issues is, is, is its own, like, self-contained story. But yet can build, you know, we can build off of that. So, I mean, so we, so we know specifically where we want to end with each issue. 
and, and how those issues build on one another. Yet still, because you know, I think it's every four issues that's collected into a trade. And so we want to be able to make that trade enjoyable. We don't want you know readers to feel like, oh, well, now I, you know, like I'm left with this horrible cliffhanger. But we also want to make it intriguing enough to where the reader is satisfied with that particular story, but wants to go on and read more. So it's it's a bit of a del you know balancing act, but that's what we strive to do. Anything else specific in the hopper at, at Boom? Um, there's something coming up, and again, you know, it's one of those can't talk about it. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm well, sure you've yeah, yeah, heard that before. Are talk they about superheroes? I mean, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, okay. Uh, nothing. Nothing else that I can talk about. Either. Okay. All right. <laughs> I didn't know if you had any other plug. Do you want to plug on Twitter or Facebook? Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find me on Twitter um, at Rogestoodle. I would do a search for Michael Allen Nelson Twitter, <laughs> uh, just because Rogestoodle is such a idiotic word that I made up years ago. Well, I had a dream that I won't even go into that. So anyway, um, and then you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I have a, a fan page or you can just find my normal page and stalk me there. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.